I got it. <coughs> My fault. Um, you mentioned the exercise uh, on midterm that APRA has been carrying on. And uh, one of the suggestions that uh, came out of that has got to do with the landscape, the, the research landscape in uh, Europe. Now, not only within that exercise, but also outside, one often hears some, not necessarily complaints, but some notations that that landscape over the years has been growing to a point where it has become very complicated. And that is both with the research and innovation in the framework program and the research and innovation components elsewhere, many other programs so on, on, on energy, on health, on digital, etc. but also within the framework program, where over the years we've been adding um, the partnerships, the, the, the EIT, the partnerships, the missions, etc. And uh, between some of these components, between some of these components, um, there are potential overlaps. Do you think there is a way to rationalize, to streamline this, uh, this landscape in, in the future? There's been a sort of uh, stratification. One comes along, one, I mean, one DG, one commissioner comes along, adds something, great idea, but then without maybe uh, eliminating what was there. Or, so is there a way to, is there a need? Do you, do you perceive a need to further rationalize that landscape? Um, well, <laughs> good question. Um, there is one message that um, we have already heard loud and clear, even if it is perhaps a bit generic as a message. And it is that um, we certainly have not achieved yet um, the level of simplicity that um, is desired for um, potential users um, of the framework program. And I think that the um, reason of dissatisfaction um, also has to do with, yes, a um, certain multiplication of instruments that we have seen, especially over the past years. Uh, at European level, with no doubt some overlaps, with different instruments being uh, capable of financing the same the same things. Um, I personally believe that we we need to seriously and comprehensively revisit the landscape. Of what the of the instruments that are financed under the EU budget, because today there are too many. Um, we are also too thinly spread out, basically. If you think that we have um, by now we have a so-called just transition fund, and we have a social climate fund. And we have an innovation fund, uh, which is there um, to finance demonstrators um, of net zero technologies. And we have what we can do under the framework program as well on net zero technologies up to demonstrators. So I do believe personally that we need to um, put all that on the table and uh, we need to try to make that landscape uh, more comprehensible, more understandable uh, and easier uh, to use. This said, um, and I think in a country like Italy, um, this is often one thing 
uh, that comes to mind. Um, we also need to recognize that we have some policy instruments which are there to follow different purposes and which can happen to also be capable of financing some uh, uh, similar projects. And here I mean cohesion policy. Cohesion policy is a policy as well, uh, following uh, its, its own logic. Um, and um, we should not see that, I believe, as you know, excessive complexity across the, across the landscape. Um, but what we should there also try to achieve um, is um, the right kind of um, possibilities for mutual reinforcement, for complementarity, for coordination, um, what is often coined uh, synergies. And here there is, I think, scope still for improvement of um, ensuring that the rules are um, made more compatible uh, with each other under the, under the different uh, instruments. But to me, the starting point is indeed to rethink some of our instruments, especially the ones that we have created uh, more, more recently. But without losing the, the useful novelty, I emphasized, you know, we need, we need an instrument for reforms and investments, you know, which can, which can push member states, um, stimulate them to do reforms and investments. Um, impact is a recurrent uh, theme. You mentioned it yourself just a few minutes ago, and I know that it's a matter that is dear to your heart. Um, this is something that I often wondered about uh, already when I was uh, working in the commission. Is there, how can we really ensure that there is impact downstream of research projects, of research results? The matter of where do results go once the projects are completed? Can we really ensure that in an effective way if we are not able to monitor what happens after the end date of a project. Uh, I know it's a difficult one. <laughs> I don't have an answer to that. But is there, is there something that is worth uh, um, thinking about? Because I know that if we prolong the time we monitor a project, we need the people to do it, etc. and this is also an additional challenge. Well, I'm the layman and you are the expert here. <laughs> um, so, um, I would just very prudently um, share, um, let's say, my, my feeling on this. And my feeling on this is that um, certainly, you know, having systematic impact is not what we should be looking for. But we should be for maximizing the chances that research results would be picked up in one form or another. And in order to maximize those chances, we might want to reflect further in the direction which was tentatively already chosen under Horizon Europe um, when introducing the, the element of uh, exploitation and dissemination of results. And here, I think we should reflect a bit further uh, and see whether as part of the funding of projects, um, uh, we, we could foresee a bit more of a systematic phase indeed where um, those results are brought to wider attention um, uh, and having some, uh, some, some part of the funding reserved for, um, for that. Again, I said I, I speak prudently here because I am not um, knowledgeable in detail enough about how it is now working under Horizon Europe, but 
the, the sense I have gained is that there is there some room for, uh, for improvement. If we have the time, I'm looking for signals, a quick one. Uh, I know you're not going to talk about the budget of the next framework program. I'm not so naive as to think that you may uh, launch in, into that. But there are voices uh, rising from the parliament uh, that say we need to double. They've been talking, Eler and, and Carvalho have been talking about 200, uh, 200 billion. Uh, do you think it's a battle worth fighting? Would you advise Eler and Carvalho that this is worth fighting? Is it realistic? Well, they have the legitimacy of their mandate. <laughs> they are elected. <laughs> so they have all the legitimacy in the world, I think, to defend that, uh, that stance. Um, what I have no difficulty in emphasizing again is that, and here I know we share that, um, uh, that determination, it is that um, we need to convince Europe, European decision makers, not only to promise to get to 3%, but to really do it. And it is absolutely feasible. I mean, let's be clear among ourselves, what are we talking about? We are today at 2.3%. We have always said that um, with the structures we have in Europe, basically one third of the 3% should come from public funding and two thirds should come from private funding. So we are talking about a public additional effort somewhere between, I don't know, 0.2, 0 0.3% of GDP, um, structurally, obviously. I mean, if, if we remind ourselves of the latest um, spending spree uh, in the context of the energy crisis in Europe, how much have we collectively spent through public funding um, to um, cushion the blow of spiking uh, energy prices. And let's also be clear on that. I mean, we have been subsidizing fossil fuels, right? Uh, that's what we have been doing. Um, and this has cost not, you know, 0.2% of GDP. This has cost 1, 1.5% of, um, uh, of GDP. So I really think that um, it is absolutely uh, not only desirable, but feasible to reach um, uh, relatively fast that level of uh, 3%. Now, I will not make the calculation for you, but I also pitched for part of that additional public funding um, to be channeled through our common tool, because we I hope all here believe in um, the perhaps slightly higher added value, marginal added value of spending one euro more through the um, framework program than just through national, uh, national efforts in this, or that, uh, in this or that member state. So here again, um, I think the the conclusions that one can draw in terms of numbers, if you take you know, the expected GDP in 2030, what it, how much more money we would have in 2030 if indeed we spend 1% of GDP in public funding um, through research efforts and having you know, the right kind of share for the European Framework Programme, I think there is a way to, um, uh, to um, estimate more or less what that should mean then uh, for, for that framework uh, program. Good. Okay, let's end on that positive note with all my thanks, our thanks uh, for your precious insight. Thank you very much. Grazie mille.